One of the first things you're likely to try when you start learning how to write shaders is to make a scrolling shader that pans a texture over time. And you do this by adding a value, let's call it speed, multiplied by time to the UVs of your texture sampler, usually just one of the axes. The simplest way to understand exactly why this works is to imagine your UVs as two-dimensional vectors, with the pixel that each UV vector points to being the returned result of that texture sample. Adding anything to your UV coordinates can then be understood as a vector addition, placing a new vector onto the end of the existing UV vector, offsetting the sampled position. When this added vector increases its length over time by multiplying it by time, the texture coordinate it points to moves with it. The result is that the sampled texture appears to scroll, and somewhat unintuitively, the texture scrolls in the opposite direction to the vector that was added. But it's important to understand here that we're not moving any pixels, we're simply modifying each UV coordinate to point at a different pixel. So in this panning example, every UV coordinate is offset the same amount, because every UV vector has the same value added to it. But what if we want different parts of the texture to move in different directions? In this case, we need to add a per pixel offset to our texture samples, and this is exactly what flow maps are for. Flow maps, like normal maps, are simply vector information encoded as color values. Standard flow maps tend to occupy two channels, red and green, for X and Y respectively, with the default value for each channel being 0.5 or mid-gray, meaning that values above this will add movement along the corresponding axis and values below mid-gray will add movement in the opposite direction. Flow maps can be made in a variety of ways, but one of the best is this fantastic and totally free flow map painter tool. You can find the link in the description. Krita also has a brush engine dedicated to painting vector information just like this, except I can only seem to make hellish intestinal vortices with it. So for this video's flow map example, I want to create a swirling and churning planet atmosphere shader, something a bit like a gas giant like Jupiter or Saturn. Here's my base texture that I'll be using with the flow shader. It's grayscale because I'll be using a gradient texture to colorize it later, but this can of course be done with a full color image. I'll quickly author a flow map for this by importing it into Flow Map Painter and then painting it from side to side until it looks cool. Then just click bake and there we go, flow map done. Next we'll need to modify our scrolling shader to include a texture sample of our flow map. Rescale the incoming 0 to 1 values to negative 1 to positive 1 to reconstruct our vectors, then add this to the UVs of our main texture sample. But this isn't quite enough to get a good result, because the ever increasing time is shifting our UVs so far from their original positions that the surface very quickly becomes noise, and any suggestion of flow is lost. In order to get a nice continuous flowing effect, we'll need to do quite a bit more. So let's look at how a flow map shader usually works. You start by doing exactly what we just did, but instead of scaling the flow vector by time as a whole and letting that stretch off into infinity, we instead ignore time's whole numbers entirely, and only use the fractional remainder, which you can get by using the fract function. This stops the effect from becoming too noisy, but it also repeats jerkily and obviously, as the remainder reaches 1 and jumps straight back to 0. We're halfway there though. The way we get rid of this jerkiness is to do two texture samples in parallel, offsetting the phase of one of them by half. Then we oscillate between the two texture samples to cover up the pops. The effect will still repeat, but it's smooth and far less noticeable. Here's what the code for that looks like, where you can see the two texture samples with different time offsets, and finally the mix between the two, where we've repurposed the repeating time used to sample the first texture, rescaled it to an oscillation between 0 and 1, and used it to mix the two texture samples together. Here's the result, with no more pops, just smooth, multi-directional flow. Well, we're sort of done already, but since you're still here and we're already talking about UVs, we might as well cover gradient mapping. Our monochrome gas giant would probably appreciate some color too. So gradient mapping is the technique of taking a grayscale texture like this planet's atmosphere and colorizing it based on the brightness of each pixel, such that dark values pick colors from the bottom of a gradient and bright colors from the top. The gradient itself is another texture, usually one pixel tall and arbitrarily wide, but usually quite small. For this example, I'm using a width of 32 pixels. 
To achieve this effect, we only need to add a single line to our existing shader, rather than taking the sample of our main texture and sending that straight to the color output, we could instead use that value as the UV input of another texture sampler, sampling a gradient texture. And just like that, we have color. The reason this works is very simple. The value of our grayscale image is, of course, being turned into a UV coordinate, a two-dimensional vector. But since our texture is only one-dimensional, being only one pixel tall, we can ignore the y-axis of the UV coordinate and clearly see how dark values will result in short vectors, picking from the left of the gradient, and bright values will create longer vectors, reaching off to the right. This technique is incredibly simple and very powerful. Right off the bat, we can swap between different gradient textures and completely recolor our planet. I'm sure you can also imagine how great this is for things like trees and foliage, which you can author in grayscale and then use different gradient textures for different seasons, or just to add variety without requiring a new set of asset-specific textures. And that's it for this episode. As always, if you enjoyed the video and would like to see more content like this, be sure to like and subscribe and maybe check out the other videos on my channel. If you'd like to get your hands on the project files for this video, you can find those as well as the project files for all my other videos over on my Patreon page, linked in the description. Thank you very much for watching.